Good morning, everyone. This is the newsroom in New York, ready to call in our correspondents at home and overseas with the latest news. For a summary of all important developments, we take you first to Edward Doyce reporting from London. This is London. There is no fresh news of the advancing American and British troops in Tunisia. An American military spokesman here this morning said that press reports were obviously ahead of the official communiques. He hoped, however, that war correspondents were not ahead of General Anderson. Fighting in and around Tunis and Bezerta between French troops and civilians and German parachutists has been definitely confirmed. It was authoritatively stated that in Libya, the pace of the British pursuit of the retreating enemy has been speeded up. So has the harassing of the enemy by bombers and fighters from advanced aerodromes. The British Air Ministry announced that home-based bombers of the RAF raided Genoa again last night. The weather over the target was good, and many large fires were started. Genoa has lately become the chief shipping point for Axis war supplies to North Africa. Not a single British aircraft is missing from the 1,500-mile flight. Reports from Moscow this morning declare that the German offensive at Stalingrad has been blocked. The Germans are apparently digging themselves in. In the south, Russian shock troops captured two heights near Novorossiysk. On other fronts, the situation is stated to be unchanged. The people of Marseille are astonished, according to Vichy Radio, at the large number of troops the Germans are pouring into the city. Each day so far has brought a larger influx than the day before. Sixty contingents are expected. All available housing accommodation has been requisitioned. Yesterday, schools were taken over as barracks. Trucks raced through the streets to and from the marshy seashore outside the city, fetching seaweed for use as bedding. There are reports that the Germans intend to occupy the Balearic Islands and use them as advanced air bases for attacks on Allied shipping in the western Mediterranean. It seems certain that Axis troop concentrations of this magnitude are not designed solely for the defense of the southern shores of France. Virginio Guido, Mussolini's mouthpiece, emitted a squeak for assistance last night. His article in the Giornale d'Italia was broadcast by Rome Radio, appealed to the Axis partners that the Allied offensive in North Africa was not directed solely against Italy, but equally against Germany and Japan. Dr. Goebbels wrote in his weekly magazine Das Reich that the Axis is facing its second great task in this war, which is, as he said, holding what we have conquered. And now to Grant Parr in Cairo. Hello, New York. This is Grant Parr speaking from Cairo, Egypt. Aerial bombing by the Allied Air Forces yesterday marked the progress of the German retreat across Cyrenaica. The best targets were found west of Derna and Cyrene in the Green Mountain area, which indicates that a good part of the Axis Army has passed the old defensive line at Tamimi. The Green Mountains is the Arab designation for the hilly, fertile strip uh, on the hump-shaped coastline between the Gulf of Bomba and the Gulf of Serti. Here in the Green Mountains, the Italian colonists settled before the war, and there are vineyards and wheat fields besides the usual fig trees and date palms. In Derna, the water flows along the streets and little canals, and vines sometimes form mats on light frames to shade the narrow thoroughfares. Cyrene was a great commercial city for the ancient Greeks, and later a resort for the Romans. Both Derna and Cyrene are pleasant places, but I don't think the Axis armies will tarry there much longer. Rommel knows too well what once happened to Graziani's great Italian army when it tried to hold the Green Mountains in 1941. Fires were seen burning in Derna two nights ago, indicating preparations for abandoning the city, which incidentally is more than halfway to Benghazi. The inanimate hero of the North African Air War continues to be the small island of Malta, western sentinel of the Middle East Command. Malta, aptly called Britain's unsinkable aircraft carrier, has not only defied blitz after blitz by Germany's Luftwaffe, but struck back with telling force. Malta has played a vital part in cutting off supplies headed for Tripoli along ship lanes which would otherwise be out of range for most Middle East bombers. The British garrison and the island's inhabitants have endured certain privation during the period when a Malta convoy meant sending ships under the very shadow 
of Axis territory with little air protection. But soon it will be easy to send ships to Malta. They will be able to sail right into the harbor with full fighter cover. Then Malta will sting the Italian toe in a way that is very apt to make Hitler's allies kick. But already Malta has enabled the Middle East Air Command to extend its air dominance as far as Tunisia, where the Germans are trying desperately to keep the Allies from getting more valuable air bases. One of these German-occupied fields was bombed and machine-gunned and gasoline stores, workshops, and hangars destroyed. Then, for the second straight day, enemy transport planes were shot down. Our long-range fighters got six out of a formation of 60 transports and fighters. They were northbound, but it's not certain whether they were empties going home or loaded with troops. Yet there are signs that the Axis is doubtful about its Tunisian venture. I switch you now to New York. So far on our morning roundup, we have heard from Edward Doyce reporting from London. And we just heard the voice of Grant Parr reporting developments in the North African campaign direct from Cairo. Our next stop is to the Southwest Pacific for a direct report from that battlefront. Go ahead, Australia. This is George Thomas Foster speaking from Australia. Most naturally, the North African campaign, with all its exciting sidelights, has taken over the front pages of our newspapers down here. Even the picture editors have been digging into their files for any and all pictures of tired camels and turban sheiks in an effort to keep their hand in until hotter news pictures come through from that front. The battle in New Guinea and the Solomons has been regulated to the thin insides of a wartime rationed newspaper. Since last Monday until today, news of the Southwest and South Pacific areas has been confined to little more than General MacArthur's official communique. These reports from the General, headquarters in the last two days, have brought the good news of supporting action by his bombers for our forces in the Solomons. Heavy raids Thursday and Friday on shipping up in the Bune and Fazy roadstead succeeded in knocking out a worthy number of Jap ships. There is also a plus sign in the latest report of our raids over Bune and Fazy. Besides bombing shipping concentrated there, our pilots flew further inland over Bougainville Island and bombed and strafed Kahili Airport and the adjacent dispersal areas. This feat indicates an all-important possibility, for this is the first time it has been reported that our pilots have taken our ships further than the roadstead itself, which is at the very tip of Bougainville Island. While the events in Africa are enough to crowd any news off the front pages of newspapers throughout the world, there is another reason for the realignment of the news insofar as the New Guinea campaign is concerned. It is felt by competent observers here that the game is about up for the Japs in New Guinea. Now we are at the waiting stage, and until the American combat troops flown from Australia close in on Buna, the enemy's main advance base on the northern coast of Papua, the news from this area will continue to be scant. Back on October 14th, a distinguished Australian senior officer, plugging his way up to the front line along the jungle trail beyond standing range, addressed groups of soldiers whenever he met them. His remarks went something like this. This time we are going to beat the little blankety-blank Jap, and I promise you, you will not have to walk down over these mountains again. You will come back from Buna, either by boat or airplane. Well, now it looks, sure looks, as if he will be able to make his promise good. And now to Moscow and Robert Magadoff. This is Robert Magidoff speaking from Moscow. Premier Stalin stated in connection with the Anglo-American action in Africa that the Red Army will fulfill its task honorably as it has been fulfilling it throughout the war. On the 7th of November, Monsieur Stalin forecast, quote, not far is the day when the enemy will feel the full force of new blows by the Red Army, unquote. I'd like to mention a number of vital points which make it possible for the Red Army to launch offensive action on one or more fronts in the near future. Point one. The morale of the Red Army is extremely high. 
the men are eager to come to grips with the enemy and avenge the defeats of two summers and the sufferings of millions of Russians. Two, the Red Army is well equipped with the newest types of Tommy guns and artillery and with tanks and aircraft. Three, the abolition of political commissars and the establishment of single authority in the army, which has resulted in a marked improvement in efficiency and discipline. Four, the promotion of young talent and energy to high posts. With this, I'd like to mention the contempt for high officers who have failed to gain experience from the war. They are criticized and even demoted, irrespective of their services to the Soviet Republic in the past. This is the theme of the Play Front, the most performed and discussed drama in Russia today, which tells many a bitter truth. Five, Red Army officers from generals commanding fronts down to leaders of regiments have been given the power to decorate men who have distinguished themselves in battle. This is an incentive not to be overlooked. Russians love signs of distinction and government orders have a great fascination for them besides offering definite privileges. Six, the approaching winter. To be sure, the coldest snow and snows of the severe Russian winter will hit the Red Army on the offensive harder than it will hit the enemy entrenched and populated points. For the Russians can stand cold weather better than the Germans. You must also bear in mind that the Russians had their big victories last winter and these are still an inspiration to the Red Army. Seven, the Germans have already come to a standstill on all the fronts. And last, but not least, is the faith of the Russians and the Red Army and their allies, the latest reflection of which is embodied in Stalin's yesterday statement to the AP. Goodbye from Moscow. And now for the developments in our own capital, we take you to Ray Henley in the newsroom in Washington. The latest word from Selective Service Headquarters is that the first 18 and 19-year-olds probably will be called into the Army within 30 days. There is no late word from Eddie Rickenbacker. The War Department merely says, we should hear of his rescue within a few hours, or we may never hear at all. Well, here in Washington during the past few days, diplomacy has come into its own. Not the kind of diplomacy we link with silk, high silk hats and decorations but rather the careful, painstaking preparation that brings civilian populations into the war on our side. The wealth of information your government had about the people of North Africa and about conditions there made possible the great progress we have already seen in Morocco and Algiers. And like the pool of water stirred up by a pebble thrown into its center, the effects of our diplomatic victories in Africa have rippled to other shores. All of Latin and South America is impressed by the brilliant planning and execution of our campaign in Africa. This is shown conclusively by messages pouring into the White House and State Department from heads of governments in our sister republics to the south. Even Argentina has sent a message expressing approval of our move into Africa, a move which the Argentine believes will safeguard the security of the Americas. And Chile adds her word of encouragement. Now President Roosevelt has made another important diplomatic move, extension of lease land munitions and supplies to the French and the natives of Morocco and Algiers. This will have a profound impression upon those countries and also upon all those people who have run up against the Axis. Hitler conquers and then steals and plunders until the conquered populations are reduced to privation and want. The United States is serving a lesson that the coming of our people also can mean friendliness and a full stomach. To the starved and plundered people of the world, President Roosevelt op officially proclaims, and here are his words, no one will go hungry or without other means of livelihood in any territory occupied by the United Nations. Here in this country of abundance, these, those words will not mean so much. To the starving people elsewhere, they will mean everything. And that's all from Washington. You have been listening to direct reports of the latest news given by our correspondents at home and overseas. We heard this morning from Edward Doyce in London, Grant Parr in Cairo, George Thomas Folster in Australia, Robert Magadoff in Moscow, and Ray Henley in Washington. For the latest news, keep tuned to this station. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> ¶¶ 
Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, Colonel Hans C. Adamson, and Private John F. Bartik, B-A-R-T-E-K, all of the United States Army who've been missing since October 21st when the plane in which they were flying was forced down in the Pacific have been rescued from the sea by a Navy Catalina flying boat. Captain Rickenbacker reported that Sergeant Alexander Kaczmarczyk, I'll spell that, C-A-C-Z-M-A-R-C-Z-Y-K, who was with them, he comes from New Jersey, died several days ago and was buried at sea. Lieutenant James C. Whitaker, Lieutenant John J. DeAngelis, and Staff Sergeant James Reynolds, all of the United States Army, who were also aboard the missing plane, have been located by a Navy Catalina flying boat ashore on a small island in the South Pacific. With the rescue of Captain William T. Cherry, Jr., USA, all the personnel of the Rickenbacker party are accounted for now. Captain Rickenbacker and Colonel Adamson are reported in good condition. Private Bartek, whose uh, condition is reported serious, is nevertheless expected to recover. The second group, consisting of Lieutenants Whitaker and DeAngelis and Sergeant Reynolds, are all alive, but their condition is unknown as yet. A U.S. Navy medical officer has been flown to the island on which they were located. They will be returned to a naval base in the Pacific. The rescue of all the surviving members of Captain Rickenbacker's plane, which was forced down after reporting less than an hour's supply of gas on October 21st, was accomplished after intensive and continuous search of a wide area of the Pacific by planes and ships, one of the greatest searches on record. Even the approximate location of Captain Rickenbacker's forced landing at sea was unknown when that search began. And the raft on which Captain Rickenbacker was found was picked up about 600 miles north of Samoa. That is the U.S. Navy's full report upon the rescue of the Rickenbacker party out in the Pacific. Perhaps this is a good time to recall the words of some of his friends. They said Eddie will turn up. They were echoing Mrs. Rickenbacker, who is overjoyed in New York at the present time. And they went on to say he always has said that he could get out of any kind of a jam if he had time to figure out what to do. If he had an hour's gasoline left, he had an hour to figure out what to do. Wait and see. He'll turn up someplace. And today, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker has turned up. This has come to you from the NBC Newsroom in New York.